thanks everyone for uh, uh, staying on. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce Stefan, but he's already been introduced because he spoke already. Um, so <laughs> that makes it really easy. The one thing I'd like to say is it's very nice to be say hi to him in public so that he can't come after me for the book chapters I owe him. <laughs> <laughs> Stefan. I don't think that'll work, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, the chapters are due. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about TB vaccines. Uh, we'll give a very short general overview. We'll focus on our own one. So this is a kind of disclosure a vaccine. And then also try to um, put that into the context of TB HIV um, issues. So I will talk first about how vaccines in TB or how immunity, generally speaking, in TB works. And um, that's the overview slide for that. And it's a complex slide. OK, an immune, immune response is initiated in TB typically because someone coughs. You inhale the bacteria, draining lymph nodes, take up the bacteria, and their macrophages, dendritic cells, eat them, and present them in the context of MHC. And it is both MHC1 and MHC2. I'm convinced that something like cross-priming, that is apoptotic events in the infected host cell, uptake of apoptotic plebs play a role, but the uh, evidence is still mostly from experimental animal data. In any case, CD4, CD8 T cells are stimulated, and also unconventional T cells, which I will not touch upon. The CD4 T cells probably mature into CD4 Th1 and Th17 cells, and the CD4 Th1 T cells are the major mediators of protection, as is well uh, established, and I believe that CD4 Th17 cells play a certain role, however they need uh, stringent control. They need to be controlled. They should be helpful in the early stages, but in chronic infection and chronic um, infection, they would be harmful. So CD4 T cells and then also CD8 T cells, and both are stimulated and uh, contribute to protection. So protection means, as we discussed several times, LTBI, latent infection. You are healthy, you contain the bacteria, and this happens in the so-called solid granulomas. The last stage then is if immunity breaks down, and I think we still don't fully understand it, I just call reactivation. I realize the importance of reinfection, and I think both take place more often than I at least had thought in developing countries, high prevalence countries, and that means, of course, the immune response weakens, and therefore the granuloma transforms from a solid into a caseous lesion, and disease has uh, emerged. Obviously, exogenous factors, notably HIV, play a major role in suppressing the immune response, and that is why TB is the number one disease in HIV-infected individuals. And I think that's more or less enough to kindly, roughly, talk about vaccines as they work. I have not really mentioned the B cells. I will come back at the end of my talk. I don't think that during natural infection, I don't think. Play, they play a major role, but that's open for discussion. Um, uh, and, but at least at a kind of a preventive stage in preventing infection, antibodies could play a major role, which has not been really analyzed and harnessed. So these are the three different forms of granulomas, or this is infection, where the bacteria are entering, are entering the lung. During LTBI, as I said, latent infection, solid granulomas develop. And during disease, the, disease, uh, the granulomas have become cases, caseous or necrotic at least. And what you see here in blue are the different major vaccine candidates currently in clinical trials. These are either recombinant BCG, which I will discuss in more detail soon, MTB-VAC, which is a double deletion mutant of mycobacterium tuberculosis, MVA-85, which has been uh, is the uh, modified vaccinia Ankara virus expressing a single antigen, antigen 85, and H1 and H5, two fusion proteins which are in the IC31 adjuvant. The produced and created have been created by the Staten Serum Institute in Copenhagen, and it's most likely that H4 will replace H1. So this is two fu uh, fusion proteins of two different antigens in an appropriate adjuvant. Post-exposure vaccines, again, MVA-85A is partially considered for that. We may discuss that in more detail. 
H56, M72, H56, which is a fusion protein comprising three antigens, comprising three antigens, including one so-called latency antigen. I'll come back to that. M72 from uh, GlaxoSmith Klein, ID93 created by our co-chairman, uh, Steve Reed, uh, which is, I think, four different antigens, four different antigens as fusion proteins in their adjuvant uh, GLA. Then therapeutic vaccines, maybe um, Tom talks more about that. These are currently mostly killed bacteria. Ruti is mycobacterium tuberculosis grown under harsh conditions, so to have kind of mimic the exp or induce the expression of latency antigens. Uh, M. indicus prani, which had been originally de uh, developed as mycobacterium W, and actually in the 1980s I've been working on that uh, in the field of leprosy, and has then later been found to have potential uh, protective efficacy in TB, and several different preparations of M. vacae, one coming from Europe, one from China, and another one also from Eastern Europe. So there are a number of different forms of these killed bacteria. I'm not going to discuss that. But I would like to mention that these post-exposure vaccines, H56, M73, ID93, have also to be the potential to be tested as therapeutic vaccines. But again, this is probably something that Steve could discuss in much more detail. So why do we need a new vaccine? BCG is there. It's the most widely used vaccine in the world. It has been given more than 4 billion times. Uh, and every year, 100 million children are BCG vaccinated. It's safe under normal conditions, as safe as a live vaccine could be. However, there is clearly a risk of if for HIV positive uh, newborn, or better say, newborn delivered by HIV positive mothers. And the cost is very low. It even protects partially, I would say, against tuberculous meningitis and other miliary TB or severe forms of TB in infants. However, it does not protect against tuberculosis in adults and also not in children. So better say, in all age groups, pulmonary TB is not really, prote um, there is no real protection um, against pulmonary TB by BCG. Now, all the future vaccines, let me mention that, somehow integrate into their concept BCG. The subunit vaccines, viral vector vaccines, or protein adjuvant combinations are based on a prime with BCG, so they are generally a booster vaccine. And the recombinant BCG vaccines, of course, have the backbone of BCG and transform it. This is another uh, scheme of the TB vaccines in clinical trials, and this is also a timeline. So what you see here is phase one, phase two A, B, and three, and in different colors, the different types of vaccines. What you see in red are viral vectored vaccines. It's either MVA vectored vaccines generated by the Oxford group, and as you see here, this vaccine has unfortunately not shown to be protective in children. That is, it was not better as a boost on top of BCG than BCG alone. And uh, the other one is Crucell adenovirus, which has been re repurposed actually to, uh, into a phase 2A study. Mind you that MVA is still ongoing in adults. In blue, you see a num the number of different fusion proteins in adjuvants, the M72 from JSK, H1, uh, H4, and H56 from the Staden Serum Institute. And you see again the ID93. And I don't know, Steve, whether this has already completed phase one or not, but we can mention that later. And finally, in green, you see the a couple of vaccines that are either BCG or MTB. And um, the, only, the one that is most progressed is actually our own vaccine, recombinant BCG, which I'll give a little bit more details. The other one is a double uh, deletion mutant of mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is currently in a phase one trial in Geneva without any uh, adverse events currently. Okay, let me very shortly show the data which had been published a year ago or so by um, the Oxford group. And what you see is that indeed, despite our hopes, there was no effective efficacy in this trial, bit ranging depending on the different endpoints between plus 17.3 and minus 12% protection afforded by the booster with MVA antigen 85 on top of BCG in newborn. Let me now come a little bit to our vaccine, which is a replacement vaccine, replaces BCG. So the concept, although it's not fully 
elucidated, it's a little bit of a kind of vision, the concept looks like that. BCG remains in the phagosome after being engulfed by dendritic cells or macrophages. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, despite year-long disputes, is now well accepted to egress into the cytosol, which means actually that BCG will stimulate mostly CD4 T cells, whereas M tuberculosis can also stimulate CD8 T cells because in the cytosol its antigens can be uh, loaded onto MHC1 and then stimulate CD8 T cells. So we thought originally, and we had to revise that in the, in, in the several years, several times, originally we postulated that we just take this stereolysine to endow BCG with the capacity to stimulate CD8 T cells. Why is that so? Well, Listeriomonocytogeny is, is an intracellular pathogen of low medical relevance. It produces Listeriolysin, a perforin which perforates the membrane and therefore allows aggression of Listeria into the cytosol and that allows it to stimulate potent CD8 T cell responses in addition to CD4. So we took Listeriolysin, better say the gene, integrated it into the chromosome of BCG not as a plasmid, integrated it into the chromosome, and what we saw is that it, the BCG produced listerolysin, but it was really weak in perforating the phagosomal membrane. The reason is that listerolysin has a very, very distinct pH optimum of about 5.2 uh, or so, and therefore, and BCG neutralizes the endosomal or phagosomal compartment, and therefore BCG expressing listerolysin was not very active. We deleted urease, which catalyzes production of ammonia, and therefore we now can generate an acidic pH, and therefore the BCG strain uh, can, expressing listeriolysin, can perforate the membrane. And we hope that CD4, CD8 T cells were stimulated. Later we found actually that this aggression into the cytosol of antigens seems to take place, experimental data are there, but it's apparently another mechanism that is more important, that is the induction of apoptotic events. Because the phagosome is now acidified, phagosome lysosome fusion takes place, and therefore also catepsins and other hydrolases enter the phagosomal compartment. Perforation now allows not only antigenic aggress, but also enzyme aggress, and that leads to apoptotic events. Apoptotic plebs are formed and both CD4, CD8 T cells are stimulated. Later, we also found that stimulation of Th17 CD4 T cells, and we believe, as I said before, that this plays a role because that is a transient event. You see them at a certain stage early after vaccination, but not later. We had actually, I have to confess, ignored T cell memory quite a long time. More recently, we have looked at it. And since this is also of interest for people working in the field of HIV vaccines, I wanted to show you a few unpublished data, submitted data on our efforts to define the, at the memory cells that are responsible for vaccination, with, which are activated after vaccination with the recombinant BCG. As you know, we have three types of memory cells, T-central memory, T-effector memory, and also resident memory cells. And what we did is actually a study where we focus on CD4 T cells in mice, vaccinated with BCG or the recombinant BCG, and then look at the different memory cells. With tetramers, we isolate antigen-specific T cells, in this case antigen 85B, because we got the tetramers from the NIH, and then we look at the protective efficacy of these uh, cells that are stimulated by the different BCGs. This first shows you that indeed recombinant BCG is cleared very rapidly in lymph nodes, in spleens, and never appears in the lungs, whereas BCG is there. So this is also a safety argument that it's safer because it is cleared much more rapidly, but it's also an argument that it might stimulate memory cells, actual memory cells, which are produced or stimulated in the absence of nominal antigen. So this, I'm not going into much into the details. This in black shows you the uh, recombinant BCG-induced central memory and T follicular helper cells. This is the T effector memory cells. And what you see, the central memory cells are quite higher, superior produced, generated after vaccination with the recombinant BCG as compared with BCG. The effect is far less Im impressive if you look at the effector memory cells. I'm not going into the isolation procedures. They're kind of standard in the immunology labs. Let me just focus on to this down here. If you take antigen-specific central memory T cells, this is the only population that transfers protection quite significantly, actually, whereas the effector memory cells are not active in this kind of system. And you see this effect only with the uh, numbers 
uh, in the recombinant BCG because the, the, uh, the, the classical BCG is a weak inducer of these central memory cells. So we think that one secret of the superior activity in the experimental model of our, of our vaccine is in the induction of central memory cells rather than effector memory cells and uh, follicular helper cells are in between. We see also wonderful antibody responses just in the context of follicular helper cells, but I don't know what that means at this stage. So where are we with this vaccine? It's efficient, it's safe, as been shown in several preclinical models. It protects both against the laboratory strain H37RV and Beijing strain, a clinical isolate, which we discussed yesterday as um, a kind of, although I never understand what more virulent or more pathogenic means in the context of TB, it's anyway, um, it protects against the clinical organism. It has been approved on P one level, which was a major effort in Germany, which is extremely critical about GMOs, genetically modified organisms. But now I have even convinced our Green Party that this is something to the uh, health of humankind rather than a political argument. Large-scale GMP production has been induced, um, uh, and safety toxicity studies had also been performed. We had to remove the hygromycin's resistant gene, which was originally <coughs> integrated into this uh, construct for generation, but that's out now, and it had been license to vaccine project management and believe it or not it had then ultimately license to the largest vaccine company in the world by doses and that's the Serum Institute in India. Not by income but by doses. Okay the phase one trial was performed in Germany in 2009 in young adults no um, adverse events. The phase one trial in South Africa was repeated more or less in young adults, no adverse event. Phase 2A trial in newborn uh, had been completed in its uh, core observational period of six months, no adverse events, and we have now submitted it for a phase two trial in 400 newborn in South Africa, uh, delivered by uh, HIV negative and HIV positive mothers. So this would be a recombinant BCG um, uh, if the ethical committee approves it all in HIV negative and potentially HIV positive newborn. As scientists, we still go on with the refinement of that vaccine, and I will give you three examples, which are actually is are the, our major topics. The first is try to get better immunogenicity, more T cells, and that we did by deleting nu or G. Now, I'm not going into detail, just to say from an immunologically standpoint, nu or G is a gene with anti-apoptotic effects. So if we delete it, we should get better apoptosis, and we think that this is an important step for cross-priming. And um, we did so, and indeed, this strain is even better than the listerolysin uh, positive uh, recombinant in clinical trial. So what you see here is more in, in after 200 days or 90 days, in this case with Beijing, has been also completed now at 200 days, you see this profound protection of about two log, 100-fold difference with the recombinant strain, and we get another half a log better with, um, with this strain. Let me just get that in the order of magnitudes. We're talking about 99% uh, reduction uh, which is two logs, more or less, 99% uh, reduction, and you get a other half a log. There's not much room, otherwise you would be even better and get a sterile eradication. It's, they are safer in skid mice. They survive 300 days, whereas BCG, given IV, in the similar way both, of course, um, uh, kills these mice after about 200 days at that high dose, which is being used normally for our um, safety studies. Next construction was trying to get a safer BCG, and in this case we used a PDX uh, deletion, that is we made an oxotrophic strain, recombinant strain, oxotrophic for vitamin B6. We heard a lot about vitamin B6 yesterday, so we now have a strain that's extremely safe. As you see here in the upper level, this is the Listeria monocytogenic, uh, uh, sorry, the, the recombinant BCG in clinical trials. It's much uh, it's much rap more rapidly eradicated in the different organs. And here you see the um, uh, PDX deficient mouse, uh, 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 vaccinated mouse, plus minus vitamin B6, and you see a, a rapid a sterile eradication of that vaccine. It's clearly safer, and that's also indicated here. This is BCG again. Mice at that high dose die at about 200 days. At 500 days, our recombinant BCG kills the mice, but this is already the time when mice die anyway, skid mice we're talking here. And what you see here, the, 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 the untreated mice or the mice treated with the recombinant B PDX deleted mutant um, um, are equally surviving over 500 days, which is for mouses the whole life of 80 years or whatever. 
And vitamin B6, by the way, has no influence on survival when given alone, so that has no impact. Unfortunately, this strain is not better than our recombinant BCG vaccine, but at least in several instances, it is as good as BCG. So what we have now is a strain that first was shown to have improved vaccine efficacy, then we deleted vitamin B6, we made it safer, but we also lost some vaccine efficacy, but still it's about the same, it's about the same as BCG, and actually in, in the Beijing challenge model at this uh, rather early day of day 30, it's as good as the recombinant BCG. So what we have here is a vaccine that's safer, it's equally good as BCG more or less, and it's less good Effic efficacy-wise as our recombinant in clinical trials. The last attempt to improve is to integrate additional antigens. And uh, let me just remind me what we discussed yesterday. That's the solid granuloma. Here are the mycobacteria that are in a kind of dormant stage. That's the caseous granuloma, and these are the bacteria in active stage. And um, why is that important for vaccine development? Dormancy antigens are, other, they are different from active <coughs> antigens, quotation marks. That is, the antigens that MTB produces during latent TB are distinct from those that are produced by MTB when it's fully replicative and fully biologically active. BCG expresses latency antigens in vitro, but it's frequently killed before really the immune response has been induced. So latency antigens can be shown, or immune responses to latency antigens can be shown after BCG vaccination, but they're normally weaker. Now there's a number of multi-stage subunit vaccines out, as we mentioned, 856, ID93 for example, that use such antigens, and our concept is now to bring back such antigens into BCG under a different promoter so that they are produced by BCG over long longer terms and to see, therefore, hopefully responses against these latency antigens or dormancy antigens. And one experiment which we did with HSPX, uh, RV2659, very similar to the 2660 in the H56, and RV3407, a resuscitation antigen, we indeed, I'm not going into the details, we indeed say better protection when we express these antigens with the uh, vaccine strain. And more recently, in collaboration with the SSI, we have produced a recombinant BCG expressing the H56 antigens. That this could be a prime for a booster with the dormancy um, or with the multi-stage vaccine H56 similar to the ID93. And obviously, this can also be utilized for heterologous antigens. It was Crucel. We have done a number of malaria antigens with this recombinant vaccine. We often talked about it, but never did it in integrating antigens of the HIV into this recombinant BCG. So this is more or less uh, what I wanted to say about that. And let me then, therefore, finish and remind you with a little bit pessimistic view all vaccines currently tested, including the BCG in use, including all novel vaccines, just delay TB disease outbreak. That's fine. It's not bad, but it's not really the optimal view of an uh, ambitious scientist. So wouldn't it be better to have a vaccine that achieves sterilizing immunity, notably in the context of HIV AIDS, because we all know that, of course, the best vaccine won't work if there are no CD4 T cells or CD8 T cells or both. So that could be perhaps achieved by different combinations between better prime and better booster vaccines. There may be other ways, different antigens, which we all don't know. There is no clear answer to that. But later this day, we may discuss how science really can kind of come up with models, how that could be achieved. And the other way, of course, and that would be the ideal way, prevent infection. This is my old dream, 20 bacteria entering 20 or 30 bacteria uh, entering the lung, doesn't matter. Couldn't you somehow get hold of these with antibodies that perhaps neutralize them somewhere, either by blocking uptake into epithelial cells or by increasing the effector efficacy of these, um, uh, um, uh, the, the effector mechanisms in the effector cells? We are currently building up a model for that with um, Alex Siegel at KRIS using David Baltimore's model where you have a virus expressing a full uh, antibody and seeing whether there is a proof of principle whether such antibodies could have a certain preventive effect. But the, again, this is still an open question. This is where I think antibodies, however, could come in. So all in all, I think that we 
are at a kind of a breaking point currently. We had vaccines that failed. We still have a full um, agenda, a full pipeline of novel vaccine candidates. They all act more or less in similar ways, stimulating T cells, stimulating T cells to prevent progression into disease, containing mycobacterium tuberculosis into latency. And the more clinical studies come up, I think we now get the data that we can analyze those retrospectively also looking, uh, as was guided more or less by the RV144 trial, looking at the immune response in those who are hopefully prevent, uh, protected versus those who are not protected. Clearly, it's an iterative way and it takes a long time. So these are the people who did the work. Martin Gengenbacher, Alexis Vogelsang, Steve Ries are the people who worked on the different constructs and in the immunology of the constructs. Bernd Eisel, Lilian der Grode from VPM are the sponsors of all clinical trials and bring those, uh, vac the, our vaccine through the clinical trial. And the clinical trials are done in Stellenbosch with Annika Hesseling, Mark Cotton at Sun from Stellenbosch, South Africa. And I thank you for your attention. Well, I'd like to ask the first question, make comments. So, Stefan, I'm, I think it's underappreciated how important the um, work that you're doing is because BCG is, is currently made as a mess. It's many strains, it's very little potency. So just to be able to bring the, that technology forward and improve on it is great. Do you think that um, we've had this probably this conversation before, the sterilizing immunity issue? I mean, what do you think about that in terms of durability of response? Is that really what we want? Well, as you know, um, there is one report, uh, Bill Jacobs' report, where they saw, I think, some mice with sterilizing immunity, but in principle, we have never really seen that in a reproducible, consistent way. If I'm wrong, please correct me. Um, so there is still the question open, and I would like to actually discuss that later today. I still hope, I somehow hope for the black swan in immunology, that is the unpredictable, unpredicted thing that brings up new ideas. Classically, I do not see a way that there is, will be an adjuvant. You may correct me if you have other opinion on that. I don't see a viable vaccine that really reproducibly uh, gets a sterilizing immunity. We know, we know that there are individuals out in the world who have been positive with TST positive or IGRA positive who became negative after they were no longer in strong contact on that. So that might be an interesting population. I tried to get the numbers, but I failed. Uh, I mean, the population numbers for a trial, so I failed. And um, I think that would be a way to look into that. And ERAS is well aware of these issues, I guess. And Ed has a comment on that. Uh, in, in our natural transmission model, we do see animals that clearly get infected uh, and then revert uh, their skin test reaction. We take those animals, we give them uh, hydrosteroids, and they don't demonstrate any disease. So we think that there is such a thing as transient infection, and, and, and that, um, you know, that's, and, and possibly why it's not seen in most animal models is that the dose that's given is substantially greater than yeah. the very low dose that happens naturally. Yeah. And of course, then we get, when, when I think of dose in terms of TB, it's the repeated exposure. But in, 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 and so you commented yesterday, I think, about autonomous local events versus systemic yeah. events. And I think that's really something that is, uh, needs to be further explored because it, it's, it's conceivable that the action is, 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 is more at the local. Yeah. Yes, yeah. At, at least it's good to hear that guinea pigs that are the most susceptible species in the world get uh, infected and get rid of it, which uh, I think is at least a promising sign that it's worth to look into more de deeply. Sarah and Gail. I had a question about your, the trial you're going forward with um, yes. the vaccine in newborns. And in the NBA 85 day kind of posthumous analysis of that trial, we've heard a lot about uh, the possibility that neonatal immunity is going to be different than adults. Yeah. We study everything in adults. And, yeah. and so when you think about this trial that you're going forward with, how are you going to um, address those concerns? Well, I would just argue that first we know that BCG proper works in newborn at a certain degree. Second, I would argue that in my biased view, it was always, I was always going for more than one antigen, that this is, uh, I think you're right. 
In simple words, you're right, but I would not think that MVA booster on BCG is comparable with BCG replacement by a recombinant BCG. There is hope, and uh, there are no, uh, I, I agree that it's different, but since we know that BCG works, the question will be rather, are we really better statistically than the BCG with the recombinant BCG? I don't see a way around such a study. Do you think there are studies that can be built into the <coughs> primary study to better understand vaccine yeah. in yeah. To make that clear first, these 400 babies, this is not a phase 2B trial. This is a phase 2A trial, or it, it's a phase 2 trial, I learned, which will show you whether it's safe in HIV positive babies. And that is the major issue here, safety. It's not an efficacy trial. And that would be the next step. Perhaps we can get some more information out of those babies that are protected or will develop disease, but I can't tell you with this number. To follow on Sarah's comments, um, you know, many infants are born prematurely in yes. these countries, and I just wonder if you're taking into account gestational age at the time of birth and then measurement of efficacy, because to me, I think that is one of the most critical questions. Yeah. And I'm just amazed yeah. at how little we know yeah. about prematurely born infants and their yes. responsiveness immunologically. And you couple that with malnourishment and other things that are bound to have a huge impact. Uh, I think it's something that one should seriously consider, especially after having seen the births at Barrick Wallet and knowing kind of how many of those are, are low yes. birth weight yeah. prematurely. The other thing that I, I wanted to say is that I was extremely optimistic in terms of, of a vaccine for TB until we started to learn how many of the, what we were calling reactivation or persistent infections are really reinfections. In other words, patients cured but yet now becoming infected with yet another strain. So how do you, how do you keep your optimism knowing how common reinfection really is? I mean, isn't that telling us that, that the immunity must not be long lived even in non HIV infected patients? Actually, I would like to have that as a general discussion after Tom's talk also, who is mostly on um, adults. It's a difficult question and there are no clear answers to it, yeah. I mean, I can always talk about it, but I mean, it's, a, <laughs> uh, uh, it's more talking than facts, yeah. Uh, Steph, what was your, your, your take on current approaches uh, that could be using human um, ex vivo or yeah. in vivo um, models to sort of gate the various vaccines. I, I know some interest in the whole blood killing and the BCG infection model in humans. Once again, a politically different question. I've never been fully convinced in the, um, the whole blood assay is part of it. I was not that convinced on the human challenge model with BCG, but I'm also open to any discussions. Uh, what it shows is, of course, you can protect against BCG, but since BCG doesn't cause disease, you are protected against BCG, so it's a quantitative measure. And I'm open for all discussions, but um, um, uh, I have not been convinced for our studies to include it there. Great, thank you. Um, for those keeping score, I counted two comments, two questions, and one question that Stefan refused to ask. Answer. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> Correction, I didn't refuse, to, uh, just wanted to clarify that it's better we dusk, discuss that later. But Eric is right, yeah. <laughs>